Virginians have always stood at the crossroads of the fight for freedom. It is a battle in which we all reap the benefits. After the close of World War II, Korea was divided at the 38th parallel with the communist government supported by China and the Soviet Union to the north and a democratic government supported by the Western allies to the south. On June 25, 1950, less than five years later, the United States found itself again drawn into war. The Korean War, often called the Forgotten War, was the first military action conducted by the United Nations. 22 nations supported the UN resolution and moved to defend South Korea from an unprovoked invasion from the North spearheaded by U.S. forces in a country halfway around the world. The Korean War became a study in frustration, punctuated by weather extremes, geographic hardships, political influences, and fluctuating front lines. The result was 33,741 Americans killed in action, with the enemy being held at the 38th parallel by the signing of an armistice. Today, the United States still monitors that border. Following the successful amphibious landing at Incheon Harbor and the ensuing Busan breakout, the mission for the United Nations forces changed. The fight on the Korean Peninsula was becoming a symbol of the greater struggle between the United States and its allies and the communist countries of China and the Soviet Union and their allies. As the North Korean forces retreated north toward China, plans for liberating North Korea from communist domination were drawn. As U.S. troops approached the Yalu River, the border between North Korea and China, the temperatures dropped to sub-zero and overwhelming numbers of Chinese troops entered the conflict. Dreams of home by Christmas were replaced with orders to immediately withdraw and head back toward South Korea. What followed was some of the most challenging days American forces have ever faced. On the 24th, the, uh, MacArthur came to uh, uh, Korea and uh, with the 8th Army Headquarters and to observe what he called a massive uh, uh, offensive which was going to end the war by Christmas. And he went back to Tokyo and uh, some uh, reporter asked him about uh, when the troops were going to get out and he said he hoped to have the troops out of Korea by uh, Christmas. We thought we had the war wrong. They told us we'd be back in Japan by Christmas. There was a rumor going around. And uh, you can't imagine how happy, <laughs> you know, it made us feel. But uh, after we got into North Korea, the table turned on us again. But the rumors were, and all the talk that the war's over, it's all, all finished. We're going, everybody's going back to Japan. We had set up in a position and we had no idea that Chinese were in battle there. We didn't. And on November the 4th we were hit early in the morning and I was captured that day with six other people. I was captured by the uh, Chinese. It's just it's about the worst that could happen to a human short of dying. I went all the way in, in the reservoir right to the, to the yellow. We could see it right out in front of us. Well, it was all ice. But I'd heard that it got down between 25 to 30 below. And we were outside. When the sun went down, if you had your, if you didn't have a sleeping bag, 
you were dead. Because we had these down sleeping bags, and they really, they really did a good job. But you didn't want to get caught in them at nighttime because numerous people got killed in their sleeping bags. We just didn't have the clothing for weather like that. In fact, so, someone stole my winter sleeping bag and, and I was able to find a, a summer sleeping bag, so that's, that's all I had. But the worst thing is we didn't have adequate clothing the first winter in Korea. We had those shoe packs and we probably, the Marines had practically 100% of frostbite. Our biggest problem was the cold. They say around 35 below without the wind blowing, and that wind did blow, and of course you had snow blowing. That's the reason my feet are numb, my toes and all are numb now. Have been for 50 some years from the frostbite. Fighting was real bad, and, but the weather was just about as bad. It took a, just about as many injuries as, as fighting. And not only the Chinese had the same problem. That was... That was one cold place, and we had, had a lot of people killed, a lot of people wounded, a lot of people missing. You were so miserable, I don't think you really cared if you died. I heard stories, I never did see this myself, but I heard stories that some guys would, would shoot themselves in the foot or the leg, you know, to get out of it. Got up to the, uh, all the way up to the, Chosen Reservoir, and uh, cold, it was cold. I never felt cold like that in my life. We, we were told later that it was down to 20 to 30 below zero, and the snow up to your, some places up to your knees. They kept reporting that they'd seen Chinese, but uh, General Allman, he was commanding general of the 10th Corps, he said, he said, no, nah. there's, no, there's no Chinese up there. But uh, the hills, found out later, the hills were full of, full of Chinese. Kept running into uh, small units who defended areas of the high ground along the road, largely Chinese. These were thought to be volunteer troops who had come down to assist the North Koreans. Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Regiment had been badly beaten in Unsan, and then the Chinese had withdrawn. So the, really the information was vague and spotty about Chinese, but we knew they were there. Just before we started up this 10-mile pass, we were hit by, uh, on the 4th of November, we were hit by a uh, Chinese Communist division. And by the 7th of November, the Chinese disappeared. The Chinese let us march right on up through there. They didn't make any effort to impede our progress. This is what the Chinese have been waiting for. They, they had uh, lured us up, got us out, and then we attack, and then they, they uh, uh, close in on us. Late uh, November, we were within 75 miles from the Manchurian border. The rumors had been that there were a few Chinese volunteers had come in. Those few volunteers turned out to be two field armies of 400,000 Chinese troops. 400,000 Chinese troops. It was unbelievable, just unbelievable. Those Chinese, they just came and they came and they came. I mean, you say, is there no end to these people? all night long and it's just unbelievable how those guys I you just well you, you know you're not even thinking really you're just doing what you have to do and when the Chinese entered the war they hit like November the 27th and uh, at you damn knee and they hit the army on the east side and the army was almost annihilated over there the Chinese were everywhere they were all in these uh, bridges that crossed these roads, they were hiding everywhere, every nook and cranny. You'd see, uh, see them there, you know, so you just shoot them. They just overrun us. There were just so many of them, they would just overrun our position. Some of them didn't have anything but a bugle, some of them had sticks, 
beating tin pans. Uh, some of them had just hang grenades. Some of them had rifles. And they all had these quilted, nice warm <laughs> uniforms. Just target practice, man. You could just shoot, shoot, shoot. It was just hordes of them. Just kept coming. Their objective was to annihilate the 1st Marine Division. And they sent in like a hundred and some thousand troops against probably where we were and north of us, we might have had like 10, 10, 11,000 troops. We were surrounded in, in a sense. In the daytime, they didn't attack because we had good air coverage. They didn't have any aircraft. See, they didn't have good radio, you know, communication either. And they did it with the whistles and their bugles. They had us all surrounded. So we had to fight, I mean, every day. But we moved out all the way to You Damn Knee, which was another, I'd say, 15 miles. And that's when we really got in trouble. They come in on all sides and trapped us. And the Army went up to the right and we went to the left. We got the word after that night that we were to pull back. And we said, wow, pull back. That's strange. We've never done that before, you know. Uh, we fought our way out and we left a lot laying behind us. But we, one thing we didn't do, we didn't leave nothing that they could use. We didn't leave a wounded or our dead. You don't think about what's going to happen to you, it's what's going to happen to your buddy. We were at the reservoir when the real mass hit us. And it was just like, you know, all of a sudden, horns were blowing, whistles and everything else. And you could just barely see out, out through there, but it just looked like the masses of them. We flew out all of our wounded and all of our d dead out from Hagaru. And then we regrouped and headed back towards Coterie. And Chesty Puller with his, with the first regiment, was holding Coterie. It was, it was, uh, I walked for 23 hours from Hagaru to Coterie about 35 below zero. I got the feet to prove it. We started down the mountain and they had blown out the bridge on the mountain. So the Army dropped us a bridge and uh, the third platoon of my company put the put the bridge in, but the bridge blowed out as about a 190 foot drop. But they brought all the light, light equipment across first and brought the tanks across last in case, you know, it did give out. But we got everybody across. The convoy was about 10 miles long. Plus there was about 100,000 civilians mixed up in the convoy too. And you didn't know whether they were enemy or foe. We actually brought 100,000 of them out on board ship. I wouldn't be here if it wouldn't be for the Air Force. They really give us close air support. The Corsairs was the greatest thing in this world. But they, that's what really cleaned them out. But the air support got us out, or we'd have never got out. The Chosen was a mistake. We went too fast in the winter time. We were fortunate in that respect. We had good, good command at our head, you know, and General O.P. Smith was, you know, one of the best in Chester. Chesty Pulley couldn't ask for a more leader, you know. And uh, Colonel Litzenberg was just as good, and Colonel Murray, they were all good. The Marines started coming back in. They stopped about 100 yards out. This was a day or two later, and formed in a, a formation and came in saying the ring over him. <laughs> they, they'd been beat all pieces, they bandages and everything. But uh, beat up but not beat. And uh, that, I thought that was, it was one of the best ring over <laughs> things I ever saw in my life. You know, it was like 78 miles 
uh, to you damn knee back to uh, Ham Hung where, they, where we got evacuated from. But we fought all the way back out to that area. Then in Hung Nam, we picking up Marines and uh, soldiers and taking them back. Physically, they were pretty well worn out. I had to watch at sea and I come down and there was one Marine laying in my bunk. So I said, Christ, let him stay there. I wasn't about to wake him up, God. I mean, they were, they weren't beaten. I won't say that, they never give up, but they did one hell of a job to get out of there, to get out of there alive. Well, the Army was just as tough, too. Then they told us that we were cut off and uh, uh, we were out of ammunition. And come to find out, our, our rifles weren't even far. Got us started moving out, and I was rear guard uh, on the road, and uh, it was so cold we had to walk to keep warm. We traveled all that day and up into the night, I don't know what hour, that we finally got back to, uh, to where our outfit was. All we had was our carbine. We had lost everything. And uh, got got little ways there, and we got uh, halted, you know, and of course, when he halted me, I fell on the ground. I was, I was wore out, and uh, so I reckon I went to sleep because I woke up the next morning, and they fired all night, and I woke up the next morning. I had a blanket on me. My section chief had put a blanket on me, and I sat right there and slept, and they had turned the gun around and was firing back the way we came. So, and <laughs> I slept right through it because I was, I was used to my fire. Do some of the first, the plan to drop back to Higaru if we could get there. So they unloaded all the trucks. I think we had about 30 trucks, or 30 vehicles, not all the trucks, all the jeeps and other things. Uh, and loaded them with wounded and dead. When we got to Coonery, the attack continued and some four or five miles further from Coonery on the night of uh, the 25th of November, the Chinese hit us in full force. From then on, it was a terribly difficult, costly, confused withdrawal back toward Coonery uh, with heavy losses. 3,000 men, and I think they said after the best count that they could figure that came through Higaru down there, it was about 350, 345, I believe they said, that was qualified to still, still fight. The rest of them was wounded, dead, or captured. So from Coonery to an area which turned out to be what we call the, the gauntlet, was a mountain pass. And that was about a seven mile, very narrow, muddy road. In two weeks time, two weeks time, the division lost around 4,900 men. A lot of bravery, a lot of bravery, a lot of, a lot of deaths, a lot of bravery. We finally got out of there, and I, th I think to this day we owe it all to the pilots. We had Navy pilots, Marine pilots, and Air Force. And I, t I tell you, those, those guys, they, they come in there, those Navy Marines with those little Cosars. They, they drop, uh, drop that napalm, and I t <laughs> that, 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 play, that napalm would go everywhere. So. And, uh, and we'd, we'd have never made it out of the mountains, I don't think, if we hadn't had the, the pilots. They did such a great job. Don't many people know anything about the, the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir. Uh, they say, historians say, that that was the, the, the hardest fought battle that 
that the United States had ever had, including World War I, II, and Vietnam, and the whole bit. All the men that fought in that perimeter fought above and beyond the call of duty. Above and beyond the call of duty. I don't claim to be a hero. My buddies died there. They're the heroes. What would happen had the North Koreans taken Korea? There's no comparison between, from reading the history, there's and reading current news report, there's no comparison between South Korea and North Korea from an economic standpoint. We have a thriving community in South Korea. Well, when I left there, I was only back there twice. That's as far as south as I ever got, and it was shambles. And to know that uh, 42 million people are living free today, we paid a tremendous price for it. And we had a Korean minister come and tell us that how much he appreciated what we did and that he wouldn't be alive today if it hadn't been for guys like was in that room that he was talking to. And he said his family wouldn't be alive. And he said, I want you guys to know how much I appreciate it. And he was a North Korean when he started out. But I, I think it was worth it. They're free. And who wouldn't want to be free? I mean, everybody wants to be free.